Oh good, you're here. Come on, I've got something cool to show you. Come on, let's go. So this is what I wanted to show you. It's an e-locker out of a 1996 Toyota 4Runner. Or at least it will be an e-locker once I find an actuator for it. I've wanted an e-locker for years, and I finally got my hands on one. This one needs a little attention first. So the story goes, somebody converted this to use an air actuator. So there's a bunch of parts missing, and this part's been modified. The original electronic actuator was missing, as well as the little gear, so I couldn't do a cable conversion. Lucky for me, I was able to find a used actuator that was intermittent. So, maybe I can fix it? If not, at least I can do a cable conversion. I want to get this thing taken apart and see what other pieces are missing, because I think some of the detent parts are missing. So, uh, I think the first thing to do is to drain this. Before I drain it though, I'll show you real quick how this works. So right now it is in the unlocked position and it works just like the regular open differential. So you can see just that one brake rotor or brake drum is spinning. This one is not spinning. But if I lock it, now they both spin. Of course if I unlock it, only one of them will spin. Drain plug's not even tight. Maybe there's no oil in it at all. Nope. <laughs> Empty. Oh, that makes my life a bit easier. So the next step is going to be to free this third member from this axle housing. So the next thing I need to do is pull both axle shafts out. So step one would be to disconnect the brake line. An emergency brake cable, but since that's not installed, all I gotta do is take out these four nuts and this will come right out. And there we go. So this has been taken apart before because those don't match. The fellow that I bought this from said, the guy that he bought it from said that there was new bearings in here. Don't know if that's wheel bearings or differential bearings. I'd love it to be differential bearings, but I think that's very optimistic. All right. Put some cloth underneath here. Good luck. Just leave that side like that and we'll do the other side too. So with the axle shafts pulled out of the third member, we can take this out now. So there's I think about a dozen of these nuts all the way around the outside. And they're a different size. Okay, that should be able to come out now. Yep. So these things are heavy, I hate this part. Mm. There we go, free at last. Here it is, the famous Toyota e-locker. So you can see the little fork that disengages and engages the locker. Honestly, this looks way better than I was expecting. I was thinking there was gonna be surface rust on everything, but this actually looks pretty clean. It'd be interesting to see how many miles are on this diff. So I've gotta decide if I wanna put that diff in the back or the front. If I put it in the back, I could just bolt the whole axle housing in. That would be the easiest. However, that axle housing is like three inches wider than this one. 
and this one already is three inches wider than my front one. This is not the stock axle housing. If I do decide to install it in one of my existing axle housings, I will have to modify the cutout a little bit. One other consideration is the axle shafts need to go into the locker a certain amount. And I'm pretty sure the axle shafts that I have in the back of my 82 would be slightly too short and I run the risk of shearing one of the gears inside the locker. I'm going to put this locker in the front of my 82. There's three reasons. Reason number one, I already have a locker in the back, a lock right. Reason number two, lockers make your steering really heavy. So having a selectable is great because you can run it open most of the time and then when you need the extra traction, you can lock it in. Reason number three, I've got to pull that axle anyways and do a full rebuild. Might as well throw the locker in when I do. So e-lockers are not a direct bolt-in for the older axle housings, but they're really, really close. I am going to have to modify this cutout a little bit. I'm going to have to add a little bit of clearance here for the e-locker fork. I'm going to have to drill and retap for four studs. And I'm going to have to add a little bit of material here with a welder because there's not enough material. So what's missing? Well, this piece has been modified. So there's like a nut welded to the end that's threaded for an air actuator. I think I'm going to have to replace this. So the indicator is missing and someone just threw a drain plug in it. And it's supposed to engage with this fork, whether it's locked or unlocked. This was, this is what would illuminate the light inside the dash. There's supposed to be a spring and detent ball in here, but there's nothing. So I'm gonna have to order that as well. Normally, when you take stuff like this apart, you wanna put a match mark on each side so you don't mix it up, but these will only go back together one way because these are different on each side, so I, meh. There's a fight to get the oil seal out, and now this pinion won't drop out. Yep, it's moving. Cha ching So I put a mark on the case at the center of the bearing, but when I rotate the cage, uh, it's spinning on the case. Um, that's not good. That's supposed to be a press fit. differential all stripped before I can put it back together I will have to pick up a different gear set lucky for me I've had one in storage for a few years originally I was looking for a lock right for the front end of my truck to match the back I found this one used and it had a 529 gear set which was sweet all I would have needed to do unbolt the original diff bolt this one in and I'd be done with it but I had some concerns about how this diff was set up and there was a few red flags I didn't like. Let me show you. One of the first things I noticed was the guy reused these. Typically, when you put an aftermarket gear set in, you don't bother with these anymore. So, that's not really a great sign. So, I was going through this stiff, and I was checking all the preload on the bearings, backlash, that kind of thing. I tried patterning the gears, but it didn't have much luck. But I noticed that this, this nut was never staked and it was completely loose. I could loosen it with my fingers. I tightened it a little bit more now. So that told me that whoever set this up didn't really do a very good job. 
So I decided the best course of action would be next time I rebuild my front end, take the old diff out, take both of them apart, swap the locker over to my existing diff, and put it back together. That was a lot of work, which is why I never got around to doing it. But now I'm going to rip the gears out, throw it in the e-locker, and uh, I'll just throw the lock right in like a box, keep it as a spare. This is a four-cylinder differential compared to the e-locker, the e which is a V6 differential. These gears will work in the e-locker, but not the other way around. I'll show you when we get a little bit closer. This diff came apart pretty nice, nicer than the other one. I did find a nice little surprise, and that was that the pinion preload was set using a solid sleeve rather than a crush sleeve. This crush sleeve is out of the other differential. These bearings look pretty nice. Um, I'm not going to be using them because they won't work in the other diff, but these would make great spares if I ever have to set up a four-cylinder diff. Uh, yeah, it's too bad I could have saved myself like 30 bucks rather than buying a new one. But anyway, in order for me to put this pinion inside the V6, I'm just going to have to run a thicker shim. So there's a little shim that goes in between the pinion head and the bearing. And that sets sort of this distance, how far it meshes into the ring gear. So I have a selection of these. I'll just end up stacking them up until I have the correct distance and it will be great. I can't put this in the four cylinder diff because it would be like way in the center. I bought a V6 install kit because I couldn't find an e-locker one. The only difference between the e-locker kit and the V6 kit is this large bearing that I had to buy separate. So one of these two bearings is a spare. I won't be using it. Before I put the ring gear on, I'm going to check to make sure that there's no burrs or high spots on the back. So I'm just going to lightly run a file over it. Seems like that was worth doing because it uh, seems like there was a couple burrs on the outside. I'm going to do the same thing to the carrier. That's nice. Now the factory service manual says to put this in boiling water and then uh, pop it on there. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna do that. Just gonna see how tight this is on here. So I might be able to just tap it on, but I need to make sure that these holes line up because I won't be able to turn it afterwards. I got the ring gear on and it's a it's not a press fit which is kind of interesting bolt pattern lines up so now I can put the new bolts in I will not be reusing these we're going to be relying on the magic of thread locker so I'm gonna wind these in by hand kind of in a crisscross pattern until I get fairly tight and then I'll switch over to the torque wrench Nice and generous. Because you don't want these coming out later. Snug. Snug. And snug. Alright. And the torque spec for this is uh, 71 foot pounds. So 
So now that that's done, we can put these bearings back on. This bearing was a bit loose, so I picked up some retaining compound. So I'll put some of that on before I put the bearing on, just to make sure that it's gonna stay. So this is the bearing in question. This is the new one. So it says to put this on and then once it's installed, to rotate your assembly to kind of spread it. Uh, I don't think it's going to rotate, but so that goes like that. So this will get this part of the way on. My super fancy. We don't really want to be doing this, but just make sure it's seated. I'm gonna go all the way around like this. That's done. So I could have used the old bearing, except this cage sticks up a little bit, and then how would I get this off? It was a little bit of a conundrum. The other side will be a lot easier than this side. The bearing didn't spin on this side, so it should be as simple as just hammering this one on. All right, that's it for the carrier. So the pinion is similar, however, I need to put this bearing a certain distance away from the back of the pinion head. And I have some shims for that. Now I got some extras because I'm doing a four cylinder gear set in a V6 diff. And the magic number is 0.236. May end up having to adjust from there, but that's where I'm gonna start. So I'm gonna go through my collection of shims and I'm gonna pick some that measure point. 236 and we'll go from there. So these are the shims I'm going to start with. If I put these all together, I got 0.235, which is pretty close. Good enough place to start, I think. So these will go on like so. And then this giant pinion bearing We'll get pressed on like that. Well, that pressed together really nice. Got our shims in there. This is ready to go in the case. This is the new race. It's gotta go in here. And the outer needs to go on this side. But there's an oil retainer that needs to go in. In order to punch out this race, you have to destroy the old oil retainer. Well, that was fun. Well, we got the races installed. Let's pop this pinion in now. So, this just goes through like so. This little bearing drops down like that. I managed to get uh, this flange the nut on there, so I should be able to wind this together now. I need to set my preliminary pinion bearing preload in order to do the rest of the setup. According to the factory service manual, it is between 8.7 to 13.9 inch pounds with new bearings. I've got a little torque wrench, so I'll tighten this incrementally and I'll test it. This will have to be tighter than I have how I have it now, so. Just under 10. 
I'm going to say that's good enough for now. We'll continue. Next thing to do is to put the carrier back in, and then the real games begin. So we'll need the carrier, our two bearing caps, our big adjustment screws. This is going to be a little bit of a handful to get in. So this. on. Again, being careful. Oop. I think this is easier to do when these adjusters are not installed yet. Bearing caps on. We'll hold this together so at least it won't fall apart and then we'll line up the threads. So this thread is split between these two parts. So all I'm going to do is move this back and forth until the threads line up. So that one looks really good. Top just needs a little tap. And now I should be able to just thread this in. Once I got this threaded in, It'll lock these two pieces together, and this won't be an issue anymore. So that's nice. We'll do the same thing on the other side. We'll torque up our bearing caps. 63 foot pounds. So now that this is done, we can adjust this, which will move the ring gear back and forth, which is going to adjust our backlash. So backlash being, if I hold this so that the pinion can't spin, how far does this move back and forth before it hits the gear? This seems like a lot of backlash. I'm going to set up my dial indicator so we can take some proper measurements. Okay, I've got the dial indicator set kind of normal to the surface of the tooth. It's not quite right, I can't quite get it in the right spot, but it'll, it's good enough for this preliminary test. So right now it's at its furthest this way, so I'm going to zero the dial carefully. <laughs> okay, so it's at zero now. So if I move this now the other way, it goes all the way out to, looks like 40. That's a fair bit of movement. Eh, I'll call it 38. So according to the spec, you want between five to seven thou. So that's uh, that's a bit excessive, but that's okay. All that means is I have to wind that ring gear closer to the pinion. So I've loosened this adjuster off. I'm gonna tighten the one on the opposite side and we'll just do this over and over until we're where we need to be. Still okay, so we're, we're at about three. Oh, okay, so yeah, it's tightening it up quite a bit. That's pretty good. So the next thing to do is uh, take a sort of a read on how these teeth mesh together. So you do that with some special paint. So the kit came with this little package of paint and this little brush. Hopefully there's enough paint in here to do this setup. I'm going to paint a couple of these teeth and then uh, we'll run it through and we'll see what kind of pattern we get. Hopefully it's a good one, right out of the gate, that'd be sweet. Wow. This paint is super thick. I don't think it's supposed to be. Okay. So I'm gonna use a rag kind of put some tension on here and then with my other hand put some real torque on this. All right, let's have a look. So 
that's okay. It seems like the pattern is a little bit that way. So I could probably afford to pull the pinion in a little bit. It seems a little bit deep. But on the other side, I have no idea. It hasn't done anything. <laughs> I'm going to mess with this a little bit and see if I can get a decent pattern. It is so hard to read this pattern, but I think it's too deep. Because I can... It's really slight, but it looks like it's just contacting right there on the edge. And it's kind of the same story. If you look over here, because some of the paint got transferred just to the inside of it. Which is weird because the other side, I mean, you can see here, that's not bad. And if I bring this around. Same thing there. Like, it's not too bad. So, I'll probably take this apart, pull some shim out of it, and try it again. So you can't install the fork or the collar after the carrier is installed. So... Uh, yeah, you might want to install that first. <laughs> so, seems a good time as any since I gotta take this apart to reshim the pinion that I pop all those pieces in. So in order to put that back together, we have a new shaft to replace the one that was modified, a detent ball to replace the missing detent, detent spring, spring guide, and nut. This little cap to go on the end to so cover it all up little sensor so this is going to tell me when it's locked and when it's unlocked so the first thing i'm going to put in is the fork and these little teeth are going to go towards this hole because that's where the actuator goes this pin is going to go through this hole so i can pound it in that so this can go in either way but if i want my detent to work i need to put it in the correct orientation so that means this has to go down this is just generic gear oil. Ooh, that's probably good. <laughs> Something like that. That. You can see it, but you can basically just make out the little notch so the next thing that needs to go in is this little ball with any luck I don't drop it just like that spring next I'm gonna put a little bit of oil on here like that And this needs some thread sealant on it, but I'm just gonna throw it, throw it in for now. This will hold everything together while I test it. This goes here. Nice, very nice. So I figured I would try some trim clad. I have a, just a little can of it see if that would work a little bit better because it wasn't going to be dried out and I think it is working better you can kind of see like the little triangle shape so there's more contact happening than it looked on the previous patterns but I still think it's too deep but the weird thing is the other side looks like perfect like I'd be so happy with that if it looked like that on both sides so uh, currently I'm at 0.225, so I think I might take, say, another 5 thou or 10 thou out of that shim and try it again. I think I got it. It doesn't take all the paint off, but you can see it's touched all the way along this side of the tooth. Now the other side is definitely favoring the inside part, but it's still making contact all the way down. With this used gear set, I'm I'm done. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it like this. I ended up at 0.217 for my shim. The time has come to permanently set the preload on the pinion bearings. 
So this spacer needs to go in between these two bearings so that when this nut gets torqued down, it keeps these bearings a very specific distance apart. And I've got to figure out that distance. So I've got the spacer and I got a couple shims. The alternative to this is to use a crush sleeve. So this is the original crush sleeve. And you'd put it in there and you assemble the whole thing and you would torque this nut down like really, really, really tight. Measure your preload. Uh, not quite tight enough. Tighten it some more. Check your preload. Oh, still not quite there yet. It's a relatively easy way to set your preload because you don't have to take the whole thing apart to change out your shims. But you can't reuse these. If I have to replace my pinion flange or some seal or something like that, then I got to redo this part. Uh, another thing that can happen is if I smack the pinion on a rock or something, you can actually crush this and you'll lose your preload on your bearings, which is bad. So it's a bit more of a pain now, but this is a better way to do it. So I'm wondering if I can measure this length compared to this length and sort of figure out what shims I might need to start with. I mean, I got to start somewhere, so that might be a good place to start. This is a beautiful part. It's a shame that I have to install it somewhere I'll never see it. So this spacer measures... 1.815 and this thing measures 1.860 okay I'm gonna try this stack up so I've got about 1.853 so try that let's see how that goes so this has to go back in the housing, and then I'll pop this bearing on top. Okay, that goes like that, and then I can't quite get the nut started with the yoke installed, so this has been working fairly well. Just need a couple turns on this, really. Now this can come off. This is just the old pinion bearing, if you're wondering. There we go. All right, got this tight. I think this is too much preload. Looking for the starting torque. So yeah, we're at like 30 inch pounds already. Hasn't moved yet. Okay, that's way too tight. So that means I gotta take this apart, press this bearing out. Yeah, I'll be back. Well, I think I just found my problem. This collar is rubbing on something inside the case. I've only had this thing apart, like re shim this about a hundred times. But yeah, I bet you that's why I've got inconsistent preload. Just have to figure out where it's rubbing. I don't know if it's rubbing on this oil retainer. It's possible. Very interesting. Yep, that's exactly what's happening. That spacer is rubbing on the oil retainer. That's annoying. Not sure what to do about this. It's not like the wall thickness isn't the consistent all the way down. I might be able to take off a couple thou off of this on the lathe. I don't know. I don't uh, particularly like that idea about modifying this, but I guess that's what I'm gonna have to do. So a little work on the lathe, and now we've got clearance. Now I can put this back together. Well, that has loosened up the preload some. Yeah, back to the drawing board on uh, on these shims. I'll probably go back to 1.865 and go from there. Back to the press. 1.865 is too tight. I'm gonna try 1.873. So with 1.873 in there, it's pretty loose. I'm gonna torque this to say 175 foot-pounds and we'll check it again. 
torqued it to 150 foot pounds, but that's still too loose. I think I'm gonna have to re shim this, but I've got a bit of a problem. It's either too tight or too loose, and I don't think I have anything in between. So this was too tight, and this was too loose. I need a shim pack that's in between. I don't know if I have the right shims. I'm gonna try this. 1.867. I'll probably torque it to 100 foot pounds first, and then see what it's like. So our starting torque here is about nine inch pounds, maybe eight. So I can probably afford to go a little bit tighter. So I'll probably torque this to 150 foot pounds and we'll take another measurement. All right, here we go, 150 foot pounds, coming up. So with a torque to 150 foot-pounds, this is what we get for starting torque. Just around 10. That's nice. Check it a couple times. Oh, that's a little bit higher there. Maybe 11. That's beautiful. I am happy with that. That means I can put my pinion seal in, put ding in this nut, and this side is done. It's time to put the carrier in for hopefully the last time. There was a tip that I got about putting some anti-seize in these threads, so I'm gonna put a little bit in there just to help uh, when I get to adjusting the carrier bearing preload. I don't want to put too much because it's going to make like just the biggest mess. Just a little bit. So now that I've got these retainers on, I need to line them up this way so that these threads line up. So put that out of the way a little bit so I can see. Bottom's pretty good. Top. This is good. Now I should be able to thread this side adjuster in. Perfect. You don't want to cross thread it. You can see that you can shift the threads back and forth. So you want to make sure that they line up. Something like that. Make sure it's the same on the bottom and the top. Once you have it right, side adjuster should thread in. So now with that in there, I'm going to uh, torque these up. So these get torqued to 63 foot-pounds. You 
You can use like an angle grinder wrench to get this somewhat tight, but you're not going to get near the torque required to properly set a preload. The preload is around 100 foot-pounds on each one of these wheels. You're not going to get that with a tiny wrench. You can also tap on these to help set the bearings inside the caps. I've got both adjusters to my marks that I made previously. I'm going to double check my backlash. Seems like it might be about right, but I really should measure it with something. Then I'm going to tighten up both of these caps equally till I have roughly 100 foot-pounds of torque on them. And I'll repattern these gears just to make sure that it's good. If the pattern is good, then it's done. So we're, we're like this close. I've got my dial indicator set normal to the surface of the tooth. You can see we have 10 thou of backlash. That's pretty good. If this was a newer gear set, I might go a little bit tighter. I'm going to tighten up the uh, carrier bearing preload. It's pretty, pretty good. It's pretty tight in here now, but I can probably go a little bit tighter. And then I'll recheck this pattern and fingers crossed, be done with this. Mm -hmm. Just put some fresh paint on. It's hard to tell, but it does look like I have full contact on this side. This side has contact, but mainly down over there. I think this is good enough for this old gear set. that. Before I forget, this pinion seal needs to go in. So I gotta rip this off one more time. Yeah, that's tight. Well, apparently I forgot to press record, but I got some seal around the outside and some grease on the sealing surface. But uh, it doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to go in here. Being difficult. All right, time to retorque this to 150 foot pounds and stake that nut. foot-pounds. So all I gotta do is get a punch and just punch that part of the nut in so it can't come out. I'm gonna use a center punch and a hammer. Maybe a different type of punch would be better. Well, that's it. All that's left to do is to actually put the electronic actuator back on and test this thing. Yay!